Let's uh, do a quick review of lecture five, kind of remind ourselves where we left off. Uh, so we started talking about IMUs, or uh, inertial sensors, and uh, we kind of broke it down into two main types of sensors, accelerometers and gyroscopes. So, uh, so far we've only talked about accelerometers, uh, specifically mechanical accelerometers. And we said that the, from a, a mechanical architecture point of view, these are uh, just damped spring mass systems in an enclosure, or a damped harmonic oscillator in an enclosure. Um, so uh, here's a very simple diagram showing it. So you have your enclosure, which in the case of a MEMS device is just uh, basically a, 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 the chip enclosure. And then there's a spring with a constant K, there's a proof mass uh, with mass M, and then there's some damping mechanism with uh, damping factor B. And as an external acceleration is applied to the enclosure, it basically that force uh, is, is coupled to the proof mass through uh, the spring. And then uh, we showed that uh, by solving Newton's equations, uh, we showed that the displacement of the proof mass inside the enclosure is uh, directly proportional to the applied acceleration. In the case that the acceleration waveform applied uh, has its or its frequency content is within the bandwidth of the device, right? Because this is spring mass system, you can think of it as kind of like a low pass filter. So if you apply very high frequency inputs, you would not get a response from this. Every device has some bandwidth. Uh, specifically, so um, the transfer function that we derived for this system, h of omega, is given by this function. Uh, so h of omega is basically the Fourier transform of your response, which is this x, divided by the Fourier transform of the input waveform applied, um, or a. Okay, and that's given by uh, this expression, uh, minus one over omega zero squared minus omega squared plus j b omega over m, where omega zero, remember, is um, basically the resonance frequency of the system that also determines the bandwidth of the system. Uh, and it's related to the uh, mass and the spring constant. So omega zero is, um, it's the square root of k over m. I think. Um, so that's omega zero. And uh, in the case, again, where if, if, uh, uh, if uh, the frequency content of your input, the omegas, are uh, less than omega zero, uh, you can approximate this very well by just a constant, which is minus one over omega zero, which we call the sensitivity of the device. Okay? So that basically is a scale factor that you can just apply to A and you get the displacement X. Okay? Uh, so, and, and that's written here. Uh, okay, so um, one thing to note is that um, this device can only measure contact or specific forces. And we made an example that, for instance, if you just let it free fall in some gravitational field, it, it would not be able to measure because there is no... Uh, there is no contact to to uh, to anything basically in that situation, uh, but but in in cases where you have some contact force applied, it just works well, and uh, so then uh, from there basically to to complete the design of the sensor, we said that we need a mechanism to measure this displacement accurately, and the way it's typically implemented is using capacitive sensing. So you basically um, tie this proof mass to a moving plate of uh, a capacitor and then uh, put that in the middle of a fixed capacitor, and as the plate moves, uh, you basically pick up a voltage uh, that is proportional to x linearly, um, and then basically your, your sensor design is complete. You just need to measure that voltage, uh, um, uh, pass that through an ADC to bring it to the digital domain, and then by some very simple math, basically you need to uh, first map the voltage to displacement, which is your first linear transformation, and then displacement to acceleration, which is just a scaling, right? That's just times your sensitivity. And then uh, you basically are done. Right? So there's a little bit of simple math that the device need, needs to do to basically give you uh, acceleration directly. Any questions? Okay, so uh, let's continue. Um, so we have been mentioning uh, basically 
uh, MEMS a bunch of times, and I do want to um, talk a little bit about uh, how, how these devices are fabricated using uh, MEMS, uh, MEMS processes. Uh, before uh, we talk about MEMS, uh, one thing to note is that, remember, the, the displacement of the proof mass can be very small, right? So we are talking about nanometers, possibly even like sub-nanometer displacements. Um, so th the electronics, specifically this capacitive sensor, uh, needs to uh, be sensitive enough to pick up uh, very small signals. And for that, you want to basically maximize your signal to noise ratio or maximize how much signal you pick up given uh, a, a displacement of the proof mass. So uh, the signal is again picked up capacitively, so you want, want to maximize the capacitance, right? The more capacitance you have in your capacitive sensor, that means uh, you get better SNR. You just uh, couple more signal uh, from the movement of the proof mass to uh, your sensing mechanism. So because of that, a, a common technique is that instead of just two plates for the capacitor, uh, you basically uh, uh, build as, as, as many plates or fingers as possible. It's a still the same concept, right? So you have a bunch of uh, plates or fingers that are uh, tied to your proof mass and move with it. Uh, and then externally, you have your fixed uh, capacitor fingers are placed, but now you have many of them, so it's like kind of like a comb design. And then as your proof math, mass moves, uh, you just pick up uh, the signal that is uh, uh, linearly proportional to the displacement, but now you have much more capacitance, right? So you have just increased the surface area between the electrodes by times n, where n is basically the number of fingers, which means you have more capacitance, so you pick up a stronger signal. Um, and, and, and that really, really helps. So you basically can uh, increase your SNR by orders of magnitude with this, with this trick. Uh, and then the rest is uh, basically uh, what we have uh, talked about. Uh, so this is a, a 1D case. So in, in, the, in silicon, you basically have some anchor points, and then you generate springs here, there. I'm just showing them as lines, but these are really kind of like uh, spring patterns. And then uh, you have your proof mass, in this case, moving in, in x direction. And then uh, your, your capacitive electrodes pick up, pick up the signal. Uh, here's a, one uh, simple uh, video I would like to show, to, um, which does a better job than my, my drawing here. So before I play it, um, so what you see here, it's a simulation. OK, um, finite element simulation. And this is a sensor that was designed for, say, a, 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 an airbag uh, sensor that uh, needs to pick up uh, impact and activate the, the airbag. So on the left, you would see this car is going to drive, and it's going to hit uh, that trash can, I think. And on the top, uh, uh, sorry, on the left. And then on the top right, uh, you see kind of like the MEMS structure. So uh, uh, the inertial mass or the proof mass is, uh, uh, is uh, at the center. And then you have your capacitive plates. And the, the springs are at the two ends, basically. So this thing is going to just move in, in one direction. And see what happens as the car basically comes over and uh, hits it, and you see how it moves, and that's the, basically the signal that the capacitor uh, picks up. Play one more time. And there you go. This is like a slow motion view. But you see how the proof mass moves back and forth, and then the capacitance changes accordingly, and you pick up the signal. So, um, so that's basically the idea. And uh, if you look at basically uh, how this is uh, fabricated using the MEMS process, so what the MEMS process is, uh, again, MEMS is a huge field. I mean, you can, you can do your entire PhD on MEMS, but in, in one minute, basically, uh, what it enables is that it kind of combines micromachining techniques with silicon fabrication techniques. And uh, what's really nice about that is that on one silicon chip, you can uh, fabricate both your mechanical structure, which is the mass, the springs, the uh, uh, dampening mechanism, the, the, the capacitor uh, plates or fingers, as well as all your electronics. 
So it's all basically monolithically uh, fabricated on one die. And uh, you get this one chip that has everything integrated in it. Um, the way it works at a high level, it's kind of like a sequential process. You start with a silicon wafer, then you deposit some material on it, then you apply a mask, which kind of like selectively masks some areas of, of, the, of, of your material, then you etch away whatever material that was not masked, uh, then you remove your mask, deposit another layer, mask again, etch, so it's like sequential Material deposition, masking, etching, material deposition, masking, etching. Of course, I'm super oversimplifying it, but that's the uh, high-level idea. And by designing the, the, the right mask patterns and uh, controlling the deposition process and the, the material thicknesses, you can build very intricate structures uh, in MAPS. Okay? And uh, one thing uh, we haven't quite talked about is, uh, in terms of fabrication is the uh, dampening mechanism. And the dampening mechanism is actually interesting. So it's achieved by basically putting your spring mass system in a chamber inside the, the uh, chip, enclose it, and basically have some inert gas in there. And just the viscosity of the gas uh, generates uh, uh, the damping that you want. So by controlling basically the pressure and what specific inert gas they put in the chamber, um, they achieve the dampening that is required for the device. Uh, of course, what's uh, very important here is uh, it needs to be airtight. So uh, other gas or liquid molecules cannot get in or out of the chamber because if anything gets in or out, uh, the viscosity is, is going to change, uh, which then changes the, the dampening factor. And a change of dampening factor, of course, we know can uh, very significantly change the, the behavior of your device. It can suddenly become overdamped or underdamped or, you know, um, um, everything um, can, can, can change if, uh, if um, that uh, basically gas composition uh, or density changes. Okay, so uh, let's look at some pictures uh, to better see what these MEMS devices look like. This is an actual uh, uh, electron microscope image of uh, a, a, one of the very first commercial MEMS accelerators that was built by Bosch. This is probably, um, I should check, but I, I want to say it's probably from early 2000s, maybe, uh, like 20-ish years ago. So that's where the MEMS were uh, becoming kind of like commercialized. And it's exactly what you expect, right? So you have your two springs on the side. So these, this and that, these are, those are the springs. And they're anchored to the, to the silicon on the two ends. And then your proof mass is basically this long, narrow structure here. Uh, and then most of the basically area uh, of, of, of the device is, is taken up by the capacitive sensor. So you see these are like you have your fixed fingers and in between those there's the moving fingers that are tied to the proof mass. And it kind of makes sense. Again, uh, you, you want the device to pick up very, very small signals. So you need to generate a lot of capacitance so that it can uh, uh, pick up very small signals and that's why uh, most of the uh, basically, footprint of the device is is used up by the by the capacitors. Um, okay, let's look at some more uh, uh, modern ones. Um, um, but before that, so far we have just talked about uh, one-dimensional accelerometers. But it turns out that. Uh, it, the exact same principle can be done in two and, and three axes. Okay, so here's a 2D case. Exact same principle. You have a proof mass, right? And then uh, you have springs at the corners, okay? And now instead of restricting the motion just to one axis, uh, by design of the springs, uh, you let the mass move in two axes, X and Y, right? And then you add uh, basically two sets of capacitive sensors, one is gonna, so the, the ones at the top and bottom, the capacitance is gonna change when uh, the mass moves horizontally, and the capacitive sensors that are on the left and the right of the proof mass, those guys, it's, uh, the capacitance is gonna change uh, when, when the proof mass moves vertically, right? So with that, 
uh, again, all the principle of operation, the physics, it's all the same, but now you can sense acceleration in two dimensions. And uh, with that, you can also imagine like uh, how, how you can do it in, in, in 3D also. Again, it's the same principle. You just let the, the mass move in uh, three dimensions and uh, add another you know, capacitive sensor at the top and bottom of it, basically, and, and, and that's it. Uh, that's how you build a 2D or a 3D. Of course, I mean, we are oversimplifying it when it comes, if you, if you talk to a MEMS expert, they can, I'm sure, talk in for hours about like, all the challenges associated with you know, uh, um, um, the, 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 to, to get the process to exactly you know, build you something that does this, but at, at the at the principal or physics level, I mean, it's the same idea uh, how, how you do it in, in 2D or 3D. So here's a picture of a two-axis uh, MEMS accelerometer. This one is from Analog Devices. Uh, it's, it's a more recent device. I think this was being used up till a few years ago. Maybe you, you might still be able to get it if you search for that part number, maybe. Uh, but here you see how small it is, right? I mean, these devices are a few millimeters by a few millimeters. I mean, compared to a quarter, you see how small it is. And then if you remove the cap of the device and put it under a microscope, uh, this is what you see. Right? Uh, this is just an ordinary image, like even a lab microscope. You can, if, if you ever get one of these devices, I encourage you to do it. You can just cut the top and put it under a microscope. And you see this here, and the interesting thing, like the octagonal thing that is pretty complex looking at the center, that's the actual mechanical part. So there's the proof mass, the springs, the, the capacitive sensors and all that, which uh, you see zoomed in. Uh, and then everything around it, those are the electronics. Those are your uh, the, the the ADC, the the waveform generator. You know all the electronics, the, the amplifiers and the filters and all that. They are all on the same basically die, uh, um, monolithically fabricated, as as we said. And then if you zoom in on the actual uh, MEMS structure, so that then this one you need like an electron microscope to look at. Uh, these things are fascinating. I mean, you zoom in and they look like, I don't know, structures built by aliens or something like that. But now we understand what it is. Uh, the, the big uh, square looking thing in the center, that's the proof mass. And as we said, in this case, it can move in two axes, right? So here the two axes are kind of diagonal, X and Y. And then you have your springs at the corners. And you see you have two springs on, on, uh, at each corner because you want it to move in two axes, right? And then you have your uh, capacitive fingers to pick up uh, the, uh, the signal capacitively. And if you even further zoom in, that's, that's the, the structure. It's, it's really, really uh, fascinating uh, to, 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 to look at, especially once you consider the scale of things. So just to give you a sense of scale, um, the full width of this uh, suspension spring here is probably around uh, a few tens of microns, maybe 100 micron or so. Um, okay, uh, so between the fingers, we are, we are talking like single digit microns, probably spacing or, or something like that. Now, note that uh, these types of sensors, like accelerometers, uh, uh, they did exist before MEMS technology was developed. But they were these huge, like mechanical things with like weights and springs, and they were not reliable. The bandwidths were low, and you know, uh, not very useful. And then, um, as the MIMS technology uh, was developed, uh, it's 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 really fascinating to me, like how how far along we have come with with these fabrication techniques. And again, this is not state of the art. This device is probably, um, a, a, I don't know, a few years old, maybe five or ten years old. Okay. Uh, one more example. Uh, yes? Uh, it looks like there's like two masses and two springs from each direction. Uh, which part are... So the question is, it looks like there's two masses and two springs for each direction. Two springs, you are correct. Um, so actually, there's four springs for each direction. Uh, so if you look at here, uh, let's call this diagonal axis our x. And then you have like one, two, three, four. So you have one spring at every corner. Uh, and then same for y, right? Um, but it's all. But the mass is just one. So it's 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 basically the thing at the center. Plus it has like these uh, little you know smaller square looking thingies attached to it on the side. So it's kind of like a I don't know what you call it, but it's like a cross almost. But it's all one 
piece. It's not two separate masses. You can have two separate masses. And actually, in the next uh, example, I'll show you one where one of the axes is completely decoupled. OK? Um, so do you have like two um, like, so there's four finger sets in total, and like two for each like x mm -hmm. and y. So is that for like redundancy or? What yeah. So the question is like uh, the capacitive sensors. Do we have two for each axis, right? So again, in, if we call this our x-axis, there's these guys and there's these guys, and um, it's not for redundancy. It's again to maximize the signal you pick up. You want as much capacitance as you want. So you're leveraging the both sides of the device, and you know, uh, uh, getting more capacitance out of it. Right? More capacitance, more signal. Yes. Is this like using active control? Uh, question is, is this using active control? And the one shown here, that's a great question. I don't think so. Just looking at the structure here, I don't quite see an uh, actuator here, except this thing here, um, which I am not sure. It's, it's not enough for active actuation, I would say. Usually you want like a, almost like a full comb drive for, um, for active feedback. So I don't think this one is actively controlled. Um, but we can go pull up the, the data sheet for this device. I'm sure it's available online and, and double check. But just looking at it, it doesn't look like to me it's actively controlled. OK, next one is from an uh, iPhone. Uh, not the most recent one. This is an uh, iPhone 4, when was it? 20 years ago, almost? Some, no, not 20. 15, year, 14 years ago, something like that. Anyway, so this is from iPhone 4. And if you take an iPhone 4 and open it up and take out the main logic board, uh, just next to the CPU, the A4 chip, there's two very small chips, few millimeters by few millimeters. And this one here is the three-axis accelerometer in the, in the iPhone 4. And if you decap the chip and put it under a microscope, again, you see this very, very interesting uh, MEMS structure. And this one, um, back to uh, the question, is uh, one of the axes is completely decoupled from the other two. So uh, here you have one proof mass that moves in x and y directions, right? And they have done some very interesting structure with the capacitive sensor. So these guys here are the capacitive fingers for x, and then you see horizontal ones for y. And the proof mass here is kind of like a cross structure with a frame around it. So the proof mass is basically this plus across in the middle, and then you have four springs on the side. So that guy moves in uh, left, right, up, down. And then there is an entirely separate piece of the MEMS structure, which is for z-axis acceleration sensing. And this one here moves basically in and out of the plane. Right, so in this view, we do not see the capacitive sensors because it goes underneath and on top of it. So it's like a multi-layer design, basically. And again, if you zoom in on a on a piece of this, you see this uh, very, very, very intricate structure of the here. You see like the capacitor uh, plates. This is part of the proof mass, and this is the spring here. And there's some very interestingly all all connected uh, to each other. Um, if we zoom in a little more, and I just noticed, I think this arrow is misplaced, uh, so it should come out of this little green box here. I'll fix that. Um, just like that. OK, so if, if we further zoom in into the XY part of the device, this zoomed in picture probably shows better like uh, what's, what's uh, going on, um, right? So, so you have your springs, uh, you have your capacitive uh, fingers, and then you have your proof mass, which again is like all around plus kind of like a cross-like structure um, at, the, at the center. OK? Any questions? OK, so since we uh, are looking at, at an iPhone, I uh, want to tell you an interesting story. So we talked about MEMS. And we said that uh, the damping mechanism is, uh, is, is done by uh, having an inert gas in a chamber. So basically, you can think of like this entire MEMS structure 
in the chip being enclosed and then there is some inert gas inside that chamber and then the viscosity of the gas determines the dampening factor. So um, this, is, this is like for most people it's even like design engineers, this is detail, right? Nobody cares, like whatever is in it, it's a device, it works, we just use it, right? Yes, uh, until one morning you wake up, say you are an Apple iPhone engineer to this news headline, iPhones are allergic to helium. And uh, this is a fascinating story, it's on iFixit, I encourage you to read it, but basically at a high level what happened is that in some hospital in Chicago in 2018, suddenly everybody's iPhones stopped working. They completely were doing crazy things like shutting down, turning back on and things. And uh, they started reaching out to Apple, like, what, what is going on? And uh, it, it took them a while to figure out. Actually, there were these wild theories of maybe your MRI machines are generating weird electromagnetic interference or this or that. But it turned out that there was helium leak in one of the hospital floors. And uh, the uh, MEMS devices in the phones, um, they were not the, the, the ceiling of the uh, MEMS chamber. Uh, it was only tested under normal atmospheric conditions, which is mostly composed of oxygen and nitrogen, which are big molecules. So those molecules could not like get into the chamber and it, it was fine. But helium molecules are much smaller and they could penetrate into the MEMS device, change the viscosity of it, and guess what? Everything goes crazy, right? Your dampening factors uh, changes, your accelerometer starts doing weird things. Also, the oscillators in many new electronics are MEMS devices, so also helium was getting into the, the, the oscillators and completely messing up with the clock of the device, and uh, things were stopping uh, working. So even at, at, at like, uh, for Apple, it, it, it took a while to really figure out. And this article has a full analysis. It even shows you like the, the, the insides of the, the MEMS gyroscopes and devices. So it's a, it's a pretty fun article uh, to read about. But uh, for me, the lesson is, well, this was kind of an isolated case, and yes, it was bad, but it was figured out, and in, in the next generations of the devices, they changed the sealing material to make sure it's like airtight for smaller molecules, things like that. But what if uh, this has happened in uh, a, um, a robot that, that was sent to a planet, and many planets could have atmospheres rich in helium? And then suddenly, uh, you, there is like many, many years of research and development and billions of dollars is spent on some, I don't know, Mars rover or something. Mars doesn't have much helium, but something that goes uh, out into space. And then suddenly, as soon as the thing lands and the robot exits the landing module, it just goes crazy and shuts down. So that's why I think it's really, really important to understand at this level of detail how sensing works, even like down to the fabrication processes, because when things don't work, it's, uh, that's, that's actually when uh, you, you understand the importance of these things. Okay, any questions? All right, uh, so last topic related to accelerometers is about uh, the noise and resolution of uh, these devices. And for noise, um, I don't want to go into all the details that is in the notes. So basically, um, from the uh, what is called the fluctuation dissipation theorem, you can build a uh, model of the thermal noise in these devices. And I'll, uh, uh, in the interest of time, I'll skip the details. Uh, you, can, you can read about it, but there's a full derivation there. But at the end of it, basically, from this theorem, uh, what you can do is you can calculate the variance of uh, the thermal noise in these devices. Okay, so this expression here, um, that's the variance. So A, A sub n is, uh, uh, is, is the uh, noise or, or uh, the, the, the noise portion of the acceler acceleration that the device measures. And uh, we're taking like the variance of it. And as you see, it's given by this expression here. So it has the Boltzmann constant in it, that's k sub b. It's proportional to absolute temperature, so at higher temperatures the devices get noisier. It is also proportional, so this delta f here is the bandwidth of the signal you're trying to measure, so higher bandwidth picks up more, uh, more noise. And then you have this omega zero over m here. So omega zero again is the resonance frequency of your device, and then you have one over m. 
what's important here from, from this expression is actually this m in the denominator. Because remember, uh, last time we said that uh, generally um, the, the value of the proof mass m um, it does not affect the sensitivity of the device because devices, uh, uh, the sensitivity is 1 over omega squared and omega is kind of dictated by the application. But we see that for noise, it actually makes a difference. So um, large mass does not increase sensitivity, but it does decrease noise. That's very important. So if you want to um, design a device for very, very low noise uh, uh, applications, you want to design it with a larger value of the proof mass. OK. Um, and then from there, you can basically derive a, a full kind of like a noise spectrum. Again, I'll, I'll skip over the details. But here is uh, uh, some data we can look at. So this is um, basically the, the, the plot we are seeing here. This is from a, a real data sheet of an accelerometer. And it, it shows basically the, the noise uh, uh, power spectrum. So as a function of frequency, how much noise you expect from the device. As you see close to DC, there's always more noise. So that's kind of your 1 over F that we have talked about a, a, a few times. So And generally, that's why, I mean, always lower frequency parts of the spectrum are noisier. Uh, but uh, Above that, you basically get to a noise floor, and it's usually coded in units of uh, uh, micro-G per root hertz. And uh, what's important is for your application, you can basically, want, if you're choosing what accelerometer you want to use, you can look at the data sheet, go to the noise part where this information is given. And then you also probably have some idea of the signals you would be dealing with for your application. And if you roughly know what the bandwidth of your signal is, uh, then you can basically integrate this noise uh, function over the bandwidth of your signal and find the actual noise variance that you expect from the device. And then you can decide, OK, is this too much noise for me? Does this work? Like, is my signal going to be above noise floor or not? And so on and so forth. If this curve is not given, it's usually given uh, from measurements. But if it's not, uh, basically that the formula that I showed you, you can plug in numbers into that. That's a simplified model based on uh, fluctuation dissipation theorem. And that can predict the noise floor of the device for you. And here we have done that. And as you see, the actual noise floor, which is this like red and blue. The red and blue, they tested basically two different devices. And they're showing that they have basically the same noise. So you can just look at one of them. And then this green dotted, uh, uh, um, uh, green dotted line is basically the average of it. So that's 75 micro G per root hertz. That's what, from measurements, uh, they're telling us. And if you use our simple model for the noise floor, you get a number that is pretty close to that. You get 60 instead of 75. But order of magnitude wise, you're, you're going to be very close. So again, if this is not available, you can use your simplified model to estimate noise. You need some information. You need proof mass and omega 0 and a few other things. But you can use the formula. Yes? What is the noise variance, um, like intuitively? Intuitively, what is, the, what is the noise variance? So what it is is uh, basically, um, let's say you have some, uh, as a function of time, uh, you have some a external of t, some, no, uh, some uh, acceleration waveform applied to your device. Okay, it, it, it can be anything, but let's say it's, I don't know, it like goes up and does something like that. Okay, so let's say this is the actual thing applied. And then what your uh, device actually measures is not the perfect waveform, but there's always uh, a little bit of fluctuation around it. So this blue one might be, I'm, I'm exaggerating the noise, but just to get the idea, there's like a little bit of wiggliness on top of the actual physical waveform applied. And the noise variance is basically kind of like if you just take the, uh, the, the, the small deviations from the ground truth acceleration applied, that's kind of like a random variable for you. And then if you find the variance of that guy, that's sigma squared noise. That's the variance of those small fluctuations. Uh, going back to where the formula was? OK. So we were here. So the noise variance varies linearly with 
the bandwidth? Uh, yes. So it says that the, the noise noise variance is has it it, 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 it exactly it like the more bandwidth the the more noise. But this is your kind of like your measurement bandwidth. So if your signal um, in, in, the, in the, the spectrum of the signal has more frequency content in it. I think actually it's easier to answer your question on this plot. So you see like every, every frequency has some noise on it, right? Now if you have, if I draw my signal on top of this and let's use yellow and let's say like the, the Fourier transform of my waveform applied, I'm just going to make up something, but it looks like this, okay? That means only the noise from 1 hertz to 10 hertz is in band with my signal. Everything else, in principle, I can filter out, right? Uh, like in the DSP, because I know I'm dealing with a signal that has only frequency content from 1 to 10, everything out of band, I can apply like a digital filter or something like that and kind of get rid of it. And that's why only, and then this would be the delta F. Whatever is in band, I cannot do anything with it. That noise is going to make it into my final measurement. There is no technique to really get out of in band noise. So that's why that's kind of like your best case scenario, that if you really fit the, 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 uh, your filter bandwidth to your signal and get rid of out of, uh, out of band noise, you're still going to be left with some noise variance that is proportional to the signal bandwidth. OK? Other questions? OK, let's uh, continue. OK, so in addition to noise, there's also some systematic errors in the, in the measurements that you get out of an accelerometer. And uh, specifically, there's three effects. Uh, one is called bias. And bias is basically just constant offset in your readouts. Um, and it can come from manufacturing non-ideality. So maybe, for instance, your, your, your proof mass at rest is not perfectly centered, or you, where you assume was like x equals 0 is not where it actually lies. Uh, could be like some non-idealities in the capacitive sensors or other things. So you can have bias. Then there's a scale errors. So scale errors are basically inaccuracies in the calculated sensitivity. So remember, sensitivity is a function of your proof mass m and also the spring mass k, right? So you're going to assume some nominal values for those. But if the actual values, because of, again, manufacturing tolerances are not equal to the assumed values, those are going to show up as a scaling error. So the assumed sensitivity is not the actual sensitivity. And finally, you would have a crosstalk effect. And crosstalk, this is only a problem if you are sensing in more than one axis. Uh, and that's the fact that you can have a little bit of coupling of the signal or your measurement between different axes. So if, for instance, um, your, um, 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 as your proof mass moves in the x-axis, um, again, because of non-idealities in the, in the fabrication process, your capacitive sensors for the y-axis pick up a little bit of signal. That's false signal. That's just cross-dot signal that was coupled from acceleration in one axis into your sensor in the other axis. And there's always a little bit of cross -talk. But what's important is um, these effects, uh, they can, uh, to a large extent, be mitigated through calibration. Right? Uh, you can build up a mathematical model for it. And then uh, you can measure these, basically, by some careful measurements. And then you can cancel them out in, in DSP. Uh, so specifically, you're, you're based on, uh, to, to model these three effects, uh, your signal model looks something like this. So what this is is that A tilde here, which is a vector, we are talking about the most general case, which is a three-axis accelerometer. So yeah, uh, this is what the readout that you actually get out of the device, A tilde x, y, z. And then it is equal to this 3 by 3 matrix we call m, and we'll clarify what it is, times the actual physical acceleration, that's a, plus noise. So this a sub n is the noise, and it has three components in x, y, and z. Uh, and then you also add a beta, which is just a constant bias added to it. OK? Uh, so your A tilde is m times a plus noise plus beta. And what is m? So the diagonal entries of your matrix m, which we call alphas, uh, those are your scale factors that we talked about. Okay. So ideally, if there is no scaling error, these alphas should be 1. right? That means your 
a tilde x is, is just 1 times ax, right? And then the non-diagonal terms, which we call kappas, those are your crosstalk terms, right? So again, in the ideal case, you want your uh, M matrix to be equal to identity, right? That means there's no scalars and there's no crosstalk. Um, also, in the ideal case, you want beta to be 0 because that means there is no offset, okay? You never, like out of fabrication, you never get the ideal thing, but because you have the signal model, you can measure these, right? You can measure the bias, you can measure uh, the, the uh, crosstalks and the scale errors, and in DSP, you can correct for it. And that process is called calibration, right? Every device you buy these days, they are calibrated. So that's why uh, you, you get uh, uh, what you get out of the device. It is still not perfect, OK? But what you get is the alpha i's are very close to 1, and then the kappas are very close to 0, and also the beta is typically very small. The data sheet of the device uh, usually tells you what to expect, expect. So they tell you what the bias is, and they tell you what level of crosstalk to expect from the device. Uh, and the reason there is still, after calibration, there is some residual uh, uh, non-idealities in your signal, the reason is typically the calibration uh, is, is uh, it's, it's the same calibration applied to all devices that are manufactured, right? So they build up a model of their manufacturing tolerances and non-idealities, and then based on that model, they basically fit uh, this signal model and find what the alphas and the kappas and the betas are, and then they invert that in their DSP and make that like a calibration model. Now what happens is that that's, that is great, it uh, takes care of a lot of these effects, but there's still device-to-device -device variations, right? So you build a million of these devices, there is the process variations across those um, are, are not going to be exact same, and that's why if you apply the same calibration to all of them, it's not going to be perfect. Sometimes you get a device that is a little bit better or a little bit worse. So. If your application uh, requires much, much better uh, calibration, you need to do a per device calibration. So you can buy one or a bunch of these devices, build up your own calibration rig that applies, say, controlled acceleration in different axes, and measure the readout of the device, and then fit this to it, right? Do your own additional uh, uh, fit to this uh, signal model, and then invert that. And by invert, I mean you just like take your A tilde, subtract beta from it, and then multiply it by M inverse, basically. And then you just get basically your signal plus noise. Noise is always going to be there. There's not much you can do about noise. Um, but all these uh, other systematic errors, you can uh, do much better. And most applications do not require extra calibration. Usually, you just find a device which, uh, from the data sheet, you know by design it's guaranteed to uh, um, have the right um, amount of or a tolerable amount of like uh, uh, gain variations and crosstalk and things like that. But if you're working on a super, super sensitive application that requires almost perfect sensors, then you can do additional calibration. Any questions? Okay. So with this, we are basically done with uh, accelerometers, and we're going to move forward to talk about gyroscopes. Okay. Now for gyroscopes, um, the physics is a little more complicated than accelerometers. Accelerometers was just simple, you know, uh, linear motion, spring mass system. Gyroscope is a little more complicated, and because of that, I want to start from scratch and first build a mathematical framework that lets us analyze the physics of rotational motion, right? So remember, gyroscope needs to measure angular velocity. So there's going to be rotations. And we first build a mathematical uh, framework to study rotational motion, OK? So let's uh, start with this idea of a rotating reference frame, OK? So again, as always, uh, whenever there is physical quantities that we want to describe or measure, we need to uh, clarify what reference frame or what coordinate system uh, these are measured in, okay? So here, uh, let's assume two different coordinate systems. One is a fixed frame. Uh, it's, it's drawn in black, and it's called S0. 
So this never changes, right? This is your uh, fixed reference frame, x, y, z, OK? And then assume there is a rotating reference frame, OK? And that's drawn in blue, and we call it S sub r. So that's the rotating S. And it's going to, with some angular velocity, it's going to keep rotating, right? To describe the rotation, uh, it's typically done by a vector which is called omega, because for rotation, you need to specify two things, the axis of rotation and the angular velocity, right? So we define this vector drawn in orange, omega. The direction of it is, or the unit vector along omega, is uh, the axis of rotation. And the norm of omega is the angular velocity. OK, so then with one vector, you describe the full, full rotation, the axis of rotation and the, the angular velocity. And it's always um, um, by the right-hand right rule. So if you, if you point your thumb along omega, then your fingers are going to basically curl in the direction of rotation, right? So that's that. And for now, let's study just one point. There's a point P, OK? And uh, that, that, that we're going to look at. And for now, let's assume the point P is static in the rotating reference frame. OK? Let's, uh, uh, I want to make sure this makes sense. So this point P is kind of like tied to the rotating frame. In that frame, it, fix, it, it, it is fixed, which means in the fixed frame, P is going to be rotating with angular velocity omega. OK? Um, so specifically, if you look uh, along the axis of rotation omega, so we are kind of like in, in this uh, right side picture, we are looking along omega. Uh, omega is actually coming out of the plane in this picture. And then the way the, 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 the P is moved, as observed in the fixed frame, it's going to move in a circle, right, counterclockwise. And uh, uh, its movement from one point in time to the, to the next one, so if you observe p at time t and then go to time t plus dt, uh, it's going to move on this circle by an amount which is basically the, the radius of this circle times that little angle of rotation. The angle of rotation is just going to be the angular velocity, which is norm of omega times dt. That's uh, assuming omega is fixed. That's just the angular motion. And then the actual movement on this circle is going to be omega dt times the radius of the circle, which is, uh, if, if you call that r, uh, that's going to be just norm r. So this little arrow, which is the movement of point t, is norm r, norm omega dt in the direction phi hat, where phi hat is the tangent to the circle at, at p. Uh, one more thing. Um, to note here uh, on, the, on, the, on the left side, uh, we have kind of projected uh, our point P onto two directions. So you can write your P as U plus R, where U is the projection onto the omega direction, so that's U, and R is the, uh, basically the perpendicular component to, to, to omega. Uh, and as the point P rotates in the fixed frame, uh, U is not going to change, right? It's only R that's kind of like changing. U is always going to be the same. By, by construction, it's, uh, it's that way. And then we have this little angle theta, which is the angle between P and the omega, which is the axis of uh, rotation. Does the geometry make sense so far? OK, so two frames, one fixed, one rotating, and then we have a point P that is fixed in the rotating frame, which means it's rotating in the fixed frame. It's a little confusing, but uh, that's, that's, a, that's a problem setup. OK, now let's look at the motion of uh, P. And specifically, we want to calculate the derivative, the time derivative of P in the fixed reference frame, S0. OK, so we want to find dP dt in S0. OK, we just said that you can write P as u plus r. So substitute that, so you get d dt of u plus r, which is du dt plus dr dt, right? Now remember that we said u is fixed. In, actually, in both frames, it's fixed. In, it's fixed in s, r, it's fixed in s0. u never changes. It's the r that causes the rotation, right? So the first term is 0, du dt. Uh, all we need to calculate is dr dt. 
right? And to find the RDT, uh, we just, uh, in, in, the, in the previous uh, slide, if I go back, here, we calculated what dr is. Like this, this little arrow here, that vector, that's dr. That's how much r changes in a small time increment, right? Uh, so we can just use that. Um, so dr is r at t plus dt minus r of t, which we just showed is equal to norm of r, which is the radius of that circle of rotation, uh, times omega dt is the small angle of rotation, right? and it's in the direction of phi hat, okay? Also, remember that uh, the way we constructed our u and r vectors, I'm just gonna draw it again here. So this was u, and then there was this vector r, and this was p, this, this was the point p, right? And then we had this angle theta here, right? Uh, so by the geometry of this, this uh, right uh, triangle here, we see that norm r, is equal to norm p times uh, sine theta, right? So let's substitute that into here. So we get norm p, norm omega, sine theta dt in the direction uh, phi hat. That is dr. So divide both sides by dt, then our dr dt becomes norm p, norm omega, sine theta uh, in the direction phi hat. So that is the time derivative of p observed in the fixed reference frame. Okay, now this expression should be familiar uh, for you because that is the definition of a vector cross product. Okay, um, this is how a vector cross product is, is defined between p and omega. Uh, so then the derivative of uh, p d p d t in the fixed frame as zero is basically equal to the cross product of your uh, rotation vector omega and your point p, uh, omega cross uh, p. Okay, any questions so far? Now, why are we doing this? Again, remember, we want to study um, inertial forces that are uh, related to rotation. And in order to find forces, we know we need to uh, find accelerations, which are the derivatives of position, right? So that's where we are starting. First, we have found the first derivative of a position of the position of uh, a point that is uh, moving in a fixed frame. And very soon, we are going to look at the second derivative. But before that, we need to, our uh, uh, mathematical framework is still not general enough. Why isn't it general enough? Because of the assumption that we made uh, one slide back here, we said that point P is static in SR, right? So we assumed that P in the, it's not rotating relative or moving relative to the rotating frame. We need to generalize that, right? So let's remove that assumption. Now let's look at a point, P, that is moving in the rotating reference frame. So now the point is gonna be moving basically in both frames. It's, it's gonna be moving in the rotating frame, it's gonna be moving in the fixed frame, right? It's, it's the most general description of a point that, that, that you have. There's no um, uh, restrict assumptions on the dynamics of the point. So we can describe the position of uh, point T in the rotating reference frame SR uh, as uh, basically it's, it's uh, three components, right? It's gonna be some uh, PXR times X hat R, PYR, Y hat R, PZR, Z hat R, where this X hat R, Y hat R, Z hat R are the three basis vectors of our rotating frame, right? So these three, uh, Unit vectors describe basically the x, y, z coordinates of the rotating frame, okay? So x hat r, y hat r, z hat r, in the rotating frame, they're fixed, right? Because they're the basis vectors. But as observed in the fixed frame, the x hat, y hat, z hat of sr are gonna be rotating, okay? So now, again, let's try to find the time derivative of our point p in the fixed frame, s0. Here, the math is gonna get a little bit hairy, but all we're doing before we do it is, is just gonna be applying the, the, uh, something like the chain rule of derivatives and just some refactoring, okay? First step is, okay, so we wanna find dp dt in, in S0, so we are gonna start taking the derivative of this guy, okay? So it's the sum of three terms, uh, but each term as you take the derivative, uh, using the chain rule gives you basically two terms, right? So this first term here, as you take the derivative, you get 
two terms. You get dpxr dt times x hat r plus pxr times dx hat r dt, right? Because both of, as seen in the S0, both of these guys are going to be time varying. So you need to apply the chain rule of, of, of derivatives. So we do that, uh, and then uh, we do some refactoring. So from first line to second line, we have just reordered things. There's no real math uh, done here. So we get these three terms in the first uh, parentheses, and then uh, which is dpx dt, dpy dt, dpz dt times x hat r, y hat r, z hat r. What is this? This is just the derivative of point P in the rotating reference frame, right? So this, this first one, uh, we can just more concisely write it as dp dt in the rotating frame, right? That's the first one. And then for the second one, the second term, we, we use the, uh, um, basically what we just derived for the time derivatives of fixed vectors, right? Remember, x hat r, y hat r, and z hat r are fixed in the rotating frame because those are the basis vectors. So their derivatives in the fixed frame S0 are just going to be omega cross x hat r, this one is going to be omega cross. This is what we just derived in the previous slide, right? And omega cross z hat r. So plug that in, we get these three terms. px times omega cross x, py omega cross y hat, and pzr omega cross z hat r. Uh, we can factor out omega. Uh, so this becomes omega cross pxr x hat r, py r y hat r, pzr z hat r. But what is this? This is just uh, the point P, right? This is what we had up here. So you just plug P for that, and then it becomes this simple expression. Uh, so now our mathematical framework is complete because we can now find the time derivative of uh, any point with any type of motion in two different frames of references. One is fixed, the other one is rotating, and we know how the two are mathematically related. So your time derivative, as observed, in the fixed frame is equal to the time derivative as observed in the rotating frame plus this extra term, which is omega cross cross p. Okay, so this is really the main result that we'll be working with. Um, so, just to summarize, uh, if you're given a fixed reference frame S0 and a rotating reference frame SR uh, with angular velocity omega, and if you have some point p of t which is moving however type of motion you want, it's moving relative to both frames, then the, the time derivative of the point dp dt in S0 is equal to its time derivative in this r plus this extra term, which is omega cross p. Or more compactly, if we show the time derivatives by the dot notation, you get the p dot in S0 is p dot in SR plus omega cross um, p. And so, this, this is velocity, right? If p is the position of your point, the time derivative is velocity. So we are basically, this expression, um, the physical quantities that it's relating is the velocity observed for the point in the fixed frame to the velocity that is observed in the rotating frame, right? And you would see they are different. You see different velocities, as you would expect, right? Because if you are moving, velocities look different to you. Any questions? Okay, now we, this is our complete mathematical framework, but we want to find forces for inertial sensors, right? Because inertially we can only measure forces, not velocities as we know. So uh, we basically need to apply this mathematical framework to see how forces in a fixed frame are related to forces observed in a rotating frame. And once we do that, then we can see, can we do something about angular velocity or angular acceleration or not, okay? So let's look at forces. Um, so again, we start with some uh, particle P sub T, uh, uh, particle at, at a position P of T, uh, and let's give it a mass because we want to uh, calculate forces on this guy. So let's say it has some mass M. And let's see, uh, what forces we observe in a fixed frame and a rotating frame for this particle. In the fixed frame, it's easy, right? It's Newton's law, so F observed in the fixed frame as zero is just mass times acceleration, so it's M times uh, um, P double dot at S zero. 
Nothing new here, okay? Now let's look at what we observe if we were tied to the rotating reference frame. Okay, so uh, again, uh, acceleration in the fixed frame is just the second derivative of the position in the fixed frame, which is d dt of velocity, right? So you differentiate your velocity, you get uh, acceleration. So now we want to convert everything to the rotating frame, right? Here everything is up to this point, it's all in the fixed frame. Let's first uh, convert our p dot to what it, it is in the rotating frame. That's what we just derived, right? So the, the, the time derivative in the fixed frame is equal to p dot in the rotating frame plus this extra term, omega cross p, okay? Now from here on, again, it's, it's, it's pure calculus. What we are gonna do is we are just gonna take the derivative of this guy and then the time derivative of omega cross p and multiple times we are gonna apply what we just uh, showed, which I'm gonna write it again here. If you have some vector, I'm gonna write it as x so it doesn't get mixed up with our p, but the time derivative of x in a fixed frame is equal to the time ter derivative in a rotating frame plus omega cross x. Uh, x was bad here, because now, okay, that's a cross, that's x. Um, so, so that's what we just showed, and we are gonna use it a bunch of times on this expression. Okay, let's start with p dot. What do we get? Uh, if you want to differentiate uh, p dot and sr, uh, you get p double dot, so that's the derivative in the rotating frame, plus omega cross your p dot and sr. Okay, so these first two terms are just our thing, our mathematical framework applied to p dot and sr. And then you're going to do it on omega cross p. Uh, here, you first take the derivative of omega, you get omega dot cross p, and then you get omega cross the derivative of p, and the derivative of t p becomes, in sr frame, becomes two terms. It becomes p dot sr plus, again, omega cross p. Okay, so we're multiple times applying what we just showed, how derivatives are related between the two frames. Let's reorder things. So what is p double dot sr? That's your acceleration observed in the rotating frame by definition, right? Then you get this term, 2 omega cross p, uh, uh, p dot sr, uh, y2, because you got it once here and once here, right? So that's the factor of 2. Then your third term is omega dot cross p. And finally, you get the last term, which is omega cross omega cross p. That's like two cross products. Okay, we are done basically. So multiply both sides by m to convert accelerations to forces, right? Your left hand side is um, um, basically, and, and then we uh, reorder things. So we just keep ASR on one side and take all these three terms to the other side. So then the force observed in the rotating frame, which is mass times acceleration in the rotating frame, becomes equal to m a s zero, that's this term on top. This is a Newton force. This is the force that you observe in the fixed frame. And then you get three extra terms. First one is minus two m omega cross p dot. Then you get minus m omega cross omega cross p. And then you get minus m omega dot cross p. And these show up as extra force terms that are only observed in the rotating reference frame. The first one is called the Coriolis force, and it's, as you see, proportional to omega, the angular velocity, and uh, p dot sr, which is the, the, the linear velocity of the particle in, in the rotating frame. Then you get the second one, it's called the centrifugal force, which is um, kind of proportional to omega squared because you get omega cross omega cross p, and also the position of the device, so it's position, and then after doing the two cross products, at least in amplitude, it, it should be proportional to um, angular velocity squared. And then the last one is called the Euler force, which is proportional to the position of the device and the angular acceleration. There's omega dot in here. So that's the expression here. What's really important to note is that, physically speaking, there's only one real force acting on your particle. And that's the force that you observe in a fixed frame. So only this first term, the Newton force, is a real force. 
The, the, these three extra ones, the Coriolis force, the center, centrifugal force, and the Euler force, these are pseudo forces, also called fictitious forces. So these are not actual physical forces acting on your device, uh, on, on your particle, but these are just artifacts or observation artifacts uh, due to the fact that SR is your frame of reference is rotating. And if your frame of reference is rotating and you do not know it's rotating because you're tied to it, then the dynamics of the, you see different dynamics in the objects around you, and then you explain those dynamics by these fictitious forces that are flying on it. Okay, so in summary, uh, you get three pseudo forces observed in a rotating reference frame. So a force in a rotating reference frame is the physical force, Fs0, plus the Coriolis force given by this expression, minus two omega cross, cross p dot in SR, plus the centrifugal force, minus omega m omega cross omega cross p, uh, plus the Euler force, which is minus m omega dot cross, uh, cross p. Okay, so, uh, what is interesting from this is, well, well first, we, we now understand the physics of rotating bodies, okay? Uh, but uh, also, uh, here's something actionable, because um, at least two of these forces are proportional to the angular velocity. So if we can, or one of them is actually going to be proportional to angular velocity squared, but this first one, Coriolis force, this is the magnitude of it is going to be proportional to angular velocity. So if we can somehow measure the Coriolis force in a rotating reference frame, from that we should be able to calculate the angular velocity. That, this is going to become the principle of operation of a mechanical accelerometer. You need to measure the Coriolis force and then somehow, by doing some math and DSP, calculate the angular velocity from it. Okay. Any questions? All right. So um, here is uh, uh, one more um, kind of like a thought experiment I want to walk you through uh, to more solidify like how, how, uh, how the, the, the Coriolis uh, and the centrifugal forces specifically uh, affect the dynamics of an object as observed in a rotating reference frame. Okay, so again, assume some mass with position P of T, and here what we are move, uh, what we are doing is that um, this mass. Let's first talk about a fixed reference frame, and in the fixed frame, the mass is moving radially outward with uh, some velocity, constant velocity v. Okay, so if you're sitting uh, in the fixed reference frame, you would see very simple dynamics uh, for the mass. It's just going to move linearly at a constant velocity. That's it. Okay. Now, what would an observer in a rotating reference frame see? And if it's rotating with a constant omega, okay, uh, what would they observe? And before, before looking at the math, let's look at this uh, picture here. And this picture, uh, we should parse it uh, uh, carefully because uh, the way it's drawn is uh, I am overlaying the trajectory of the object as seen in the two reference frames uh, on top of each other. So first, uh, let's say this point that the, where the axis of rotation passes through is our uh, uh, center point also, or the origin. And this dotted black line would be the trajectory of our point in the fixed reference frame. So as I said, it's just going to move uh, on, a con on a line with a constant velocity, radially outward. So it starts at the origin, and over time it just, you know, just moves out. So the dynamics in the fixed frame is simple. Now what would an observer in a rotating frame see? What the observer in the rotating frame sees, physically the object is still just moving linearly, right? But because that observer is rotating, they would think that it's kind of like having this curved motion, right? And it's only because it's the observer that's rotating, right? So this dotted blue would be the trajectory that somebody tied to a rotating reference frame with a constant angular velocity omega would see for the object. And the shape of this trajectory can be explained by uh, the fictitious forces, right? So they would 
basically assign the two fictitious forces, which is the Coriolis and the centrifugal force, to the object, and that explains why it's going in a curved direction, right? Um, there, in this example, there is no Euler force because we assumed omega is constant, so omega dot, uh, the time derivative of omega would be zero. That uh, just uh, makes the, the Euler force zero. And uh, we can exactly calculate what the Coriolis and centrifugal forces are going to be in this example. Coriolis for uh, acceleration is uh, the force over mass, which uh, we know is minus two omega cross uh, p dot. And if we look at small time scales, right? So let's assume we are just after uh, that the object starts moving, uh, we, we, we try to measure what the Coriolis acceleration is. So what that means is that in this picture, this is kind of exaggerated. A lot of time has passed in this picture if you compare the two trajectories, and they have diverged quite a bit. But if you make your time scale very small, and you just, you know, just look around the origin, you see that the, the, the motions are, are, are still pretty much aligned as observed in the two uh, uh, frames of references. So with that, uh, what, what you can tell is that if t is small, uh, your uh, velocity that is observed in the rotating frame is almost equal to uh, the actual true velocity v of the, or at least in magnitude, it's, it's, it's equal to that because uh, not enough time has passed yet for your observations to deviate in the two, in the two reference frames. So when you want to calculate your omega cross, cross p dot, um, what, what it's uh, equal to, so we can use our uh, right hand rule. So I'm going to do it on the board here. So um, we're going to calculate omega cross p dot. Uh, again, not a lot of time has passed, so we are kind of like still on, on this portion, right? So what is omega? So omega is coming out of the plane. My p dot is kind of aligned still with this uh, black dotted line. So my omega cross p dot in direction, it's going to be kind of uh, pointing up. But in magnitude, what p dot is is just uh, the, the magnitude of v rad. Magnitude of omega is the angular velocity, factor of two just carries over, and the two vectors are orthogonal, right? Because my omega is coming out of the plane, p dot is in plane, so when you do the cross product, there's a sine theta term, right? Uh, and your sine theta becomes one, because uh, the two vectors are orthogonal. So that's why this guy becomes equal to two magnitude omega, mag mag magnitude v rat, and this e hat, is basically a unit vector that determines the direction of the Coriolis acceleration. What happened to the minus sign? We factored into the direction here. So the e hat kind of takes care of the, um, of the, of the direction. So in our exa uh, exaggerated case, um, so you see this is the Coriolis uh, force. The acceleration is also along the force. And I'm going to go back to the iPad here. So that's the force. And it's going to be uh, perpendicular to the direction of the motion uh, of, of the particle, right? Because again, because of that cross product effect, uh, especially at the beginning, omega is coming out of the plane. Uh, P dot is going to the right. So your Coriolis force at the very beginning, if I draw it with a purple arrow, it's going to point down a Coriolis, or the acceleration is going to be pointing down, OK? Um, same kind of argument for the centrifugal uh, force. I'm not going to uh, go into it in as much detail. Uh, but again, uh, you need to do the cross product twice. So you first do omega cross p. Actually, why not? Let's do that one too. Um, again, on here so I can, I can show you with my hand how the directions work. So we want to do two cross products. First, you do the inner one. So omega cross p, again, start here. Uh, p's in that direction. So omega cross p, that's going to be a vector pointing up. Right? And then you do another omega cross that one. So you do omega right hand rule. So it's going to be uh, pointing to the, to the left end. And then the minus sign makes it, flips it basically. So the direction of the centrifugal force is going to start pointing outward. Uh, but if you do it on the longer uh, time scales, it's going to be always kind of like radially pointing out uh, from where your point P is. Okay, so again, if we did it on here, we do omega, omega cross p, that's going to be a, a direction tangent to the circle here. And then you do another inner product, 
with omega to that tangent vector. So that's going to be radially pointing inward. And then you flip that because of the minus sign, and your centrifugal force is going to be pointing outwards. OK, so this is just uh, geometry, basically. But that's how the, the two forces affect uh, us. But the interesting one for us to design a sensor with is this top one, the Coriolis force. Uh, why? Because it's linearly proportional, at least at small time scales, right, before your particle moves too much and the trajectory deviates, is proportional directly, the magnitude of A, to angular velocity and the linear velocity of your um, uh, particle in the, in the uh, rotating reference frame, right? So if, if the velocity is known, um, then we can calculate angular velocity. If the linear velocity is known, we can calculate angular velocity uh, by just dividing the magnitude of the Coriolis acceleration to two times uh, the linear velocity of uh, the particle. And now we are onto something very, very actionable. Basically, we just need to design some mechanism that enables us to somehow measure uh, the Coriolis acceleration and for a known linear velocity, and then basically just take the ratio of the two times one half, and that would be uh, our angular velocity. Questions? OK, so how is this done? Um, uh, just like the case of uh, accelerometer, for gyroscopes also, we need a motion transduction mechanism. And the job of the motion transduction mechanism is to basically transform angular velocity to a quantifiable signal through this Coriolis effect, uh, in the mechanical case at least. Uh, different technologies are used for motion transduction. Uh, mechanical gyroscopes uses the Coriolis effect. That's the one we'll talk about. There's optical gyroscopes. Uh, those use very different physics. It's an it's a optical phenomena that also ties uh, angular velocity to something measurable, but very different physics. Um, there's also fluid-based fluid uh, gyroscopes. Now, for the case of gyroscopes, it actually turns out that optical gyroscopes are the most accurate one uh, that, that uh, one can uh, design and build. Um, but for uh, many, many robotics applications, they're not used because optical gyroscopes are, are typically pretty large. Um, often they're just one axis, so you need three of them mounted, you know, orthogonally to get three axis uh, gyro sensing. Extremely expensive. I mean, the cheapest ones you can find are probably many tens of thousands of dollars versus mechanical gyroscopes you can get for a dollar. Um, so because of those reasons, optical gyros, again, in... in you know, everyday robotics, they're not used. But for instance, you see, you find optical gyros in the atomic submarines and, you know, very big uh, uh, um, military applications and things like that. So um, for mechanical gyroscopes, uh, there's, there's different implementations um, um, for, for, for those. And uh, the one uh, we will talk about, they're called... Uh, a vibrational or vibratory mechanical gyroscopes, and those exactly uh, measure the Coriolis acceleration that uh, we've been talking about. And just like accelerometers, they're also fabricated in uh, MEMS process. Okay? So, um, uh, what is a, a vibrational or vibratory mechanical gyroscope? Uh, just like an accelerometer, it is a damped spring mass system in an enclosure, but uh, it needs two types of motion, uh, or there's two modes, as, 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 as we call it. Um, so one is, um, just like the example we saw, you need to generate a linear motion, and that is actively driven inside the device. Okay? So that is called the primary mode of the device, or the primary motion. And then as a rotation is applied to the device, uh, there is going to be, due to the Coriolis effect, some secondary mode excited or generated, which is the movement perpendicular to your primary mode, and that's uh, due to the Coriolis effect, as, as, as uh, we just described. Uh, so you apply some external rotation with some angular velocity omega. Again, there is a primary mode where you essentially move your mass with some known uh, velocity, v. And then uh, the Coriolis acceleration 
is going to move your mass perpendicular to both the axis of rotation and the primary movement and uh, due to the Coriolis effect. Um, perhaps this picture uh, is much easier to understand what is going on. So here's a mechanical diagram of a 1D gyroscope. And the way it works is that here, our axis of rotation is in and out of the plane. So that's this omega, basically, vector coming out. And this arrow is showing the kind of like how, how it's, uh, what kind of angular uh, motion it's, it's experiencing. And then we have this spring mass system, or a dual spring mass system. And then in one direction, which we call the primary mode, you're actually actively uh, driving it by applying some uh, actuation force F sub D. So uh, your mass is kind of like constantly oscillating back and forth in the primary direction. And that is generating that ve linear velocity that we talked about that is required to observe the uh, Coriolis effect. And then as, as soon as the device starts rotating across uh, rel uh, the, 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 the axis omega, then the Coriolis effect will generate a secondary mode or a secondary motion uh, perpendicular to both omega and your primary mode. So if you do, again, here the cross product, so omega is out of the plane, my primary motion is in this direction, so omega cross v, basically, right, or cross p dot, is going to generate an acceleration in this direction, which is the secondary mode. So intuitively, if the displacement of the proof mass in the secondary direction should be proportional to both the uh, the, the, the linear velocity, which we are generating, so that should be known, and the angular velocity, which is what we want to measure. So in principle, if we measure displacement in the secondary mode or in the secondary direction, from that we should be able to um, back out what the angular velocity is. Okay, I think this is a good uh, place to stop, and then next time we'll finish the discussion about accelerometers.